I would describe it as more persuasion money. You're misleading the public. You're trying to blame the Métis as scapegoats. Tonight, the Manitoba Métis Federation president is fuming after Manitoba's premier puts the brakes on a $70 million settlement. There's been a focus on Inuit Nunagat research, but there has not been a focus on Inuit participation. A new strategy promises Inuit control over Inuit-specific medical research and data. When you're moving, a lot of times, like, you'll move one hand faster. And young women enter the ancient tradition of Dene hand games at the Arctic Winter Games. Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. Manitoba Premier Brian Pallister has found himself in the crosshairs of Métis Federation President David Chartrand. It's over a $70 million hydro deal that the government wants out of. Melissa Ridgen explains. All but one member of Manitoba Hydro's board of directors quit yesterday saying that they can't work with Brian Pallister's government. This was a board of directors hand-picked by the Premier. When he was asked yesterday about the revolt, he told reporters that they quit because of a deal they had inked with the Métis, a deal he won't support. I would describe it as more persuasion money. That comment sent Manitoba Métis Federation President David Chartrand through the roof. You're misleading the public. You're trying to blame the Métis as scapegoats because you have failed in your duty to do due diligence and meet with that board. Hydro and the Manitoba Métis Federation agreed on $70 million to settle past disputes over hydro developments as well as future expansion. The agreement was key to avoiding long and costly court battles the public utility can't afford in time or currency. He's going to cost the taxpayers, including me as a Métis taxpayer, he's going to cost us millions and millions of dollars of legal costs in the courtroom. He says calling the $70 million settlement persuasion money amounts to race baiting. He points out that government has these sorts of agreements anytime there's a dispute with landowners, including farmers. He also says that the replacement board at Manitoba Hydro will be little more than Pallister puppets, and the MMF is preparing for a court battle with the province of Manitoba. Melissa Ridgen, APTN National News, Winnipeg. The national organization that represent over 60,000 Inuit in Canada says it's out with the old and in with the new. That is when it comes to doing medical research. Here's Annette Francis with that story. Today's launch of the National Inuit Strategy on Research is being celebrated with drum dance performances and speakers. According to Nathan Obed, the president of the Inuit to Parrot Kanatami, there's a new way to do research. Our first approach, it is to let all of our partners know that this is the new way of doing business. That we are expecting over time for research processes to change, for the research relationship to change, and then also the governance of research to change. So whether it's uh, through meeting with existing institutions, meeting with federal ministers, or with working within our own Inuit family to ensure that we are set, uh, set up for the ultimate uh, success of this project. Ovid says in the past, research projects in the north were done with no input from the Inuit and rarely done about the Inuit. He said this needs to change. The new strategy is aiming to put Inuit-specific research in the hands of his people. The strategy will lay out the foundation of how all new research projects will move forward in partnerships with universities, research institutions and governments. There are hundreds of millions of dollars that are allocated uh, to Inuit Nunagat research. There's a whole legacy of research that has happened in Inuit Nunagat. Really, uh, for every Inuk in this country, uh, there, are, uh, for every three Inuit, there's one research publication about Inuit and about Inuit Nunagat. So there's been a focus on Inuit Nunagat research, but there has not been a focus on Inuit participation. Minister Carolyn Bennett was on hand to support the announcement. She says it's an important step. So today is a very exciting day in terms of how the ITK and, and, and the Inuit are now going to say that they, they are going to, in their democratic um, institutions, be able to direct and have Inuit um, determine their priorities and how they work um, with research. And According to President Obed, he's hoping to have the strategy fully in place within 18 months. Annette Francis, APTN National News, Ottawa. 
The College of Physicians and Surgeons of Saskatchewan has charged Dr. Murray Davies with two counts of professional misconduct. Davies was at the center of a 2013 APTN Investigates expose about excessive prescribing of opiates to Indigenous communities in the Kamsak area near the Manitoba-Saskatchewan border. Community members told APTN Investigates that Davies was overprescribing opiates, then shuttling his patients into a methadone program which he also ran. Health Canada stripped Davies of his methadone license in 2014, but he was still allowed to prescribe opiates. A hearing date for the new charges against Davies has not been set. Manitoba RCMP have announced an arrest in the death of a young mother in God's Lake Narrows. Crystal Andrews' body was found on a trail in a wooded area in the community of God's Lake Narrows on November 8, 2015. The 22-year-old was heading home from an after-party following a Halloween social. The RCMP says witness accounts and DNA evidence led police to charge 37-year-old Michael William Okima. Taken tragically and far too soon. Crystal left behind two children of her own and had three foster children. She had a partner she shared her life with. She had a family. She was adored by everyone who knew her. Crystal brought a smile to everyone's face. The federal and Ontario governments are committing $1.6 billion to connect more than a dozen First Nations to the province's power grid. The announcement was made by Indigenous Services Minister Jane Philpott in Thunder Bay. 22 First Nations own Wate Nikaniap Power, the company getting the money to build power lines to 16 First Nations. The chiefs of those First Nations say the new source of power will improve the lives of their members. A 13-year-old water protector from Wikwemekong Unceded Reserve in Northern Ontario addressed the UN today. We must do something and we need to do it now. Autumn Peltier addressed the United Nations General Assembly in New York City on World Water Day, launching the International Decade for Action on Water for Sustainable Development. Peltier has traveled the world advocating for water management and Indigenous issues. Our water should not be for sale. We all have a right to this water as we need it. Not just rich people, all people. No one should have to worry if the water is clean or if they will run out of water. Great work, Autumn. We're going to continue our deeper look into the child welfare system after the break. But first, here's a look at tonight's Nation to Nation. Hello, I'm Todd Lamaran, and here's what's coming up on Nation to Nation. Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Carolyn Bennett is crisscrossing the country in an engagement sessions to spell out how the government's Indigenous rights framework is going to work. Bennett's Parliamentary Secretary, Yvonne Jones, defends the process on her political panel. As well, we talked to Ontario's Human Rights Chief Commissioner on why she described racism in Timmins as being pervasive and normalized. And a parliamentary committee continued to hear from Indigenous MPs on why Native languages need to be heard and understood in the House of Commons. It's coming up right after the national news. Here's a look at Friday's weather forecast starting on the East Coast. Cloudy and plus one in Halifax, Charlottetown and St. John's. A sunny 12 below in Nain, sun's out in La Grande and minus 9. Minus 9 in Shibugamu, 0 in Septiel in Quebec City. Sunny in southern Ontario, minus 2 in Sarnia and Sault Ste. Marie, 0 in Toronto. Minus 4 in Sudbury, Timmins and Capus Casing. A balmy 0 in Churchill on Friday, plus 4 in Flin Flon and the Paw, plus 3 in Barons River and Gimli Harbour, minus 1 in Winnipeg. Plus two in Yorkton, Regina, and North Battleford, where there will be flurries. Zero in Buffalo Narrows, plus five under sunny skies in La Ronde. Welcome back. We're going to continue our look at the child welfare system now. And eventually, children do get out of care. Even if they are never able to go home, they grow up and leave the system as young adults. It's called aging out, and that age is different in every province. 
and can be longer if there are special re reasons, such as health reasons. But in BC, the age is usually 19 years old. Tina House met some of the, these youth who told her what it was like to leave the foster care system and be suddenly on their own. I'd say at this doorway right here, um, I'd move spots from here and over on the other side. There's a lot of cars around here too. Um, I did not have no coverage or nothing. It was just me and my clothes, uh, a duffel bag I had at that time. And yeah, that's pretty much everything I had there. Andrew Walkis aged out of care five years ago. He was immediately homeless. It was kind of difficult um, not being able to, to have something to eat most nights and also feeling quite dehydrated and I don't know, it just felt, felt kind of lonely. Walkis grew up in and out of care, living in approximately 10 different homes. His dad, a residential school survivor, drank and could not care for him at the time. After aging out of the system, Andrew was alone. He slept in this alley and sometimes in this park in a tent. 700 kids will age out of the foster care system this year in BC. On their 19th birthday, most will leave state care and be left to fend for themselves. A lot of us describe it as a cliff where all of the supports around us evaporate because of arbitrary legislation. 22-year-old Dylan Cohen also aged out of the system. He'd been put in foster care at the age of 13, along with his twin sister, Haley. Their mother was unable to care for them. He says he was abused. He won't talk about the details. I ran away. I put on a jacket and left my foster home in the country at minus 35 and fled for my safety. And where did you go? What happened? Can you tell me the story? Yeah, that night I was picked up by a police officer who tried to advocate for me to get uh, charges pressed on me and so that I would have somewhere safe to sleep that night. And I got thrown in the back of a police cruiser and taken to the shelter that I came into contact the first day I was in care. And I was in that shelter terrified and after that couch surfed and went to other shelters and eventually found a not very suitable placement. At 16, Cohen was deeply depressed. He says he even contemplated suicide. You know, I had a really dark mental health episode uh, due to the foster care circumstances we're in. But Cohen was also driven to activism. He got help from others in that community. Life's more settled now, and he has a job. He works full-time for an organization called First Call. They help kids that have aged out. I want to make sure that there are emotional, social, financial resources for every youth that hits 19 or 18 in the system. In 2017, Cohen organized a rally with other aged out kids on the lawn of the BC Legislature. They want better conditions for kids in the system and more support for those leaving. I know that our experiences are often characterized by these really shameful and uh, horrible abuses of the system but it's up to us to do more and up to society as a, as a collective responsibility taker for youth and care to do more. And one of those organizations doing more is Luma Native Housing. They have an initiative for youth housing. They also offer training in life skills and employment and meal programs every Monday and Wednesday night. This is where Amber Moon and Andrew Walkis gather with others who've aged out. And for Andrew Walkis, Life just got a little bit tougher with the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. And he's thankful for the help from Luma Native Housing. Yeah, like I, I would go for at least a couple couple weeks at a time without eating if, I, if it wasn't for them. And I'm, even with the insulin too, I'm supposed to have three meals a day as I was out I'd go in a coma. 19-year-old Amber Moon has learned how to cook from staff at Luma Native Housing. She lives upstairs in this studio apartment, along with her cat Lola and her lizard. She loves to play her ukulele and is very artistic. Amber also has big dreams to travel the world. These stickers mark the places she wants to go.
When she was seven, Moon was put into foster care along with her brother and sister. Her mother was addicted to drugs, and her father, who suffered a brain injury, could no longer care for them. She was mostly well taken care of in the system, but the loss of her family still deeply affects her. I feel like it's been pretty hard for me to see my parents um, the way that they are, but also yeah, I wish I could have lived with my parents, but at the same time I feel like um, that I have more opportunities that I've been in foster care. A few years ago, her grandmother sent her these family photos. It made me really happy because I didn't, like, I'd never seen these pictures before. And some of them are kind of funny. <laughs> yeah, and then this is um, my mom, my two oldest brothers. And there's me and my brother and my sister. All of these former foster kids have different stories, but they have one thing in common. A rough start. I feel like um, having more supports after somebody ages out and also trying to fix the families first before taking away the children. Their stories are not unlike so many others that have aged out. That's why they are considered the most vulnerable in our society. You know, you take any teenager who's lived in a dozen placements, might be moving every year, might be going through three or four high schools like I did, and you're going to have some negative outcomes. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. So many stories out there. Well, one game is ancient, the other is relatively new. We're off to the Arctic Winter Games right after this quick break. Here's a look at the rest of Friday's weather forecast, picking back up in northern Alberta, minus 9 in Peace River and Grand Prairie, minus 4 in Red Deer, plus 4 in Lethbridge, 7 above in Medicine Hat. On the west coast, plus 8 in Victoria, Tofino, Vancouver and Campbell River, cloudy and plus 5 in Prince Rupert and Smithers, 0 in Prince George. A sunny day in the Yukon, minus 7 in Whitehorse and Mayo in NWT, 13 below in Yellowknife and Ray Lakes, minus 8 in Fort Liard, minus 28 in Saks Harbor, 23 below in Pulatuck and Colville Lake in Nunavut, very nice, minus 2 in Whale Cove and Arviet, minus 12 in Cape Dorset, minus 14 on Friday in the Callaway. Welcome back. Creating the venues for the Arctic Winter Games takes planning and resources. This year, athletes traveled to the small town of Fort Smith, population 2,500. The community brought in Whitehorse native Tyler Nickel to build a brand new snowboard course on the slopes of the Slave River. Our reporter Tamara Pimentel caught up with the designer of the track. So how long did it take to create this? Um, it took uh, two weeks in the summertime, uh, me and a bulldozer and a little bit of trucking and some tree removal and put together three venues for, for the Arctics. And can you tell me about some of the features here? Yeah, we've got like a rail jam site, so which consists of uh, seven rail and box features and a wall ride, just a nice little course for the kids, and then uh, a small big air with a couple different jump options, and then uh, a pretty great little border cross track. And what about some of the talent you've been seeing the last few days? What's the most impressive thing you've seen so far? Um, probably just like the younger kids uh, breaking some barriers and like doing like personal bests and stuff. Like, yeah, obviously the older guys did some great tricks, but seeing the young kids like just have some personal bests was probably the, the most special part of it. And do you know being in the north if this is a common thing? Um, Having a snowboard park in a little community like this isn't really a common thing. No, it's pretty cool though, and you don't necessarily need a lift. You just need to slope the ground and shape it and let it snow and, and hike, you know. All right, thank you. I'm Tamara Pimentel here in Fort Smith for the Arctic Winter Games. Some incredible scenery at that course. The Dede Hand Games are an ancient sport and one of the most popular events at the Games. It's a game that historically has been only for men. 
But as Charlotte Mort Jacobs tells us, this year, women are also competing in the sport. They move their bodies to the beat of the drum. Six female teams playing the ancient sport of hand games at the Arctic Winter Games. First time playing hand games was actually two years ago when I went to Greenland for Arctic Winter Games. Um, I have, I've only played it a couple times besides that, so here's really the only place that I get to play it. Some would say they're more energetic than their male counterparts. When you're having a lot of fun and smiling a lot, you kind of throw them off. Team Alaska doesn't get to play the game often back home, so when they can at the AWG, they make the most of it. When you're moving, a lot of times like you'll move one hand faster or you'll pull it back or keep it close to you. And so like you just have to like watch yourself like, and see, like try to get it to be an even movement or like an even like bounce just, just so they don't call you on that call. As you can see, hand games are popular in the NWT, but traditionally women would not play them in this territory. Now with the Arctic Winter Games, that's changing. Deborah Heron, a coach for Team NWT, says she has seen more interest for women in hand games in recent years. It's a sport, it's fun. The beat of the drum makes you want to move. Yeah, so I like it. My family loves it. Hand games may be exciting, but it's still very much a boys club. Some Dene leaders have vocalized their disapproval for NWT women to play hand games because of tradition. For longtime community coach Paul Boucher, it is important to recognize how each of the five regions feels about women playing. It's mostly the traditional regions that are don't have, that uh, that have uh, women don't play. The Sawtu and the Atlicho, and I respect that. 22 women tried out for Team NWT in the 2018 AWG. Johnny Dragis is one of them. A traditional way back then that we weren't supposed to be playing because of like how like powerful like us girls were with like the menstrual like cycle that we have. The girls understand why women didn't traditionally play, but also value the importance of choice. We were too powerful. Yeah. So by like birthing and creating life, so we couldn't. Um, and now everything's changed. That it's just your personal preference. Deborah Heron says some of her players had to seek permission to play from their community, but she sees a positive change happening that reflects the times. For myself, growing up and not being able to play and having my kids being able to play, it's, it's amazing. Controversial or not, these women will not quit, calling shots, throwing or hiding anytime soon. Charlotte Mont Jacobs, APTN National News, Katlodeche, First Nation. Amazing stuff, and if you're like me and can't get enough of the Arctic Winter Games, you can find much more over on our website, aptnnews.ca. That is your APTN National News for this Thursday. Stick around for Nation to Nation with Todd Lamoran. That's next. I'm Dennis Ward. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.